I think when it comes to China reporting, there just isn't follow-up. There isn't real investigation. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country. Anti-Asian hate crimes rose over 300% in 2021 compared to the year before. Media in the West never seemed to question his qualifications or challenge him. It's, it's envy, it's jealousy, it's their, their deeply seated beliefs that they are superior, all unraveling. One example is how media mogul Rupert Murdoch can control public discourse through the media empire that he owns. Greed for attention using whatever means. Pride is literally killing us. We cannot see beyond our own faults. There is no such thing at this state of the world's history in America as an independent press. You know it and I know it. There is not one of you who dares to write your honest opinions and if you did, you know beforehand that it would never appear in print. We are the tools and vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks. They pull the strings and we dance. These words are commonly attributed to the New York Times former managing editor John Swinton in the 19th century. A scathing self-reflection of journalism for someone who held such an important position. Is the situation any different today in the Western mainstream media? They assure people they can be trusted. But is that the truth, especially when it comes to reporting on China? Having followed countless stories on this topic, I have discerned at least seven widespread ills that plague today's international media. I can borrow from the religious terminology the seven deadly sins, namely pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath and sloth. What do I mean? Let me explain one at a time and I'll do that in reverse order to appeal from the more superficial vices to the core of the problem. And let's start with deadly sin number seven, sloth. When it comes to China, it's somehow the norm for professional scrutiny to lose its vigor. A US news channel recently aired a photo as evidence that the Chinese delegation did not stand up and applaud after Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke during a World Economic Forum meeting held in Davos, Switzerland. The claim and the photo were provided by a U.S. congressman who has been interviewed at Davos to single out China for not sharing the West's stance on the issue. He even claimed, without being challenged, that the Chinese had blood on their hands. However, it turned out the photo had no Chinese people in it. Instead, it showed Vietnamese delegates, including a deputy prime minister. Clearly, it was a blunder and the TV channel just accepted the congressman's words about the photo, no questions asked. I think when it comes to China reporting, there just isn't follow-up. There isn't real investigation. A lot of it is just based on misconceptions and preconceived notions of China and its society, its economy. It isn't based on real work. In a statement upon the request of a Chinese media, the channel said they regret the error and have reached out to the congressman's office for a statement. How about doing that before the damage was done? By the way, I have yet to see any public apologies or corrections made on the matter by the channel or the politician. This was not the first time such a blunder was committed when 39 victims died during a human trafficking case in Essex, UK in October 2019, some UK media speculated they were escaping the Chinese regime even before the victims' identities were confirmed. That everyone inside this trailer was a Chinese national. But just let's say they're Chinese nationals, just let's say they come from a, a regime perhaps. 
Instead of exercising caution, the media jumped on the police's initial statement that these people were believed to be Chinese nationals. The media announced to the world that the victims were Chinese. Days later, it turned out they were all from another Asian country. They're stuck in stereotypes. They're still thinking that, you know, Chinese people are so poor that they're immigrating anywhere. That was true a long time ago. It's no longer true. Such blunders clearly angered many Chinese people. Speaking of which, the next deadly sin, number six, is about emotions, wrath or anger. Over the past few years, there seems to have been growing emotionality toward China in the media, especially since Donald Trump came into power in January 2017. One case in point was the trade war. High-capacity remarks about China's purported IP theft triggered my televised debate with a former Fox business anchor in May 2019. China has gotten away with stealing as high as $600 billion in intellectual property from us every single year. The Chinese have stolen it. In reality, China has invested in IP protection because it's in China's interest. China also has its own IP to protect. In 2019, China overtook the United States as the top source of international patent applications filed with the World Intellectual Property Organization and has since stayed at the top. Obviously, there is a system-wide, country-wide effort uh, in this whole transformation of the economy to greater value addition or, if you like, a transformation from uh, more labor-intensive to more intellect-intensive work. And we've seen that and it's been a very successful operation, of course, in China. Before launching this infamous trade war, Donald Trump made a barrage of scathing insults against China, which were disseminated by media around the world. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. I say go down there and squeeze Chinese heads. What China's saying is we need to keep stealing as much as we can from you. The trade war is deemed to have been a humiliating failure, costing the average American family over a thousand US dollars a year without achieving its initial goals. The media has definitely failed in preventing such disastrous policies or holding policymakers accountable. Anger-stoking speech continued to find its space on the media after COVID-19 caught the world unprepared. Kung flu. And not without consequences. Violence against Asians has shot way up across the Atlantic. Statistics show anti-Asian hate crimes rose over 300% in 2021 compared to the year before. I mean, you can draw a direct correlation between the hate speech that was generated by Donald Trump and the number of attacks on Asian Americans. It went from two, a couple a day instead of a couple a month. If you care, you will not allow this kind of careless, irresponsible, unprofessional journalism on the air. Besides excessive emotions, I've also witnessed a promiscuous use of dubious sources to back up accusations targeting China. Let me use the example of Xinjiang for deadly sin number five, gluttony, feasting from the same place of toxic sources. Most evidence of the so-called human rights abuses in Xinjiang can be traced to only two sources. One is a so-called senior fellow for China studies by the name of Adrian Zenz with the far-right Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. It's an organization authorized by the U.S. government in the 1990s, which is known for preaching regime change. By cobbling together dubious sources, he had made extremely broad estimates about the number of so-called detained Uyghurs in Xinjiang, from hundreds of thousands to 1.8 million. And he tries to shirk responsibility by admitting the severe limitations of the study. This photo that you mentioned not only shows an elderly couple visiting, being visited by a free medical clinic and receiving free medical care that I think many of my neighbors in the United States would yearn for, uh, they're surrounded by elderly people. I don't see anyone in the photo who is of childbearing age. And Zent cites this photo as an example of uh, coercive birth control. 
measures and mass surveillance, which really goes to his own prejudice. Despite his work on Xinjiang never being published by any academic institution, never having been peer-reviewed, media in the West never seemed to question his qualifications or challenge him. He became a U.S. recognized pundit on the subject and contributed to big media outlets including the New York Times, the Washington Post and CNN. Why is it only one, one very small handful of people all connected to the U.S. or British government always being referenced? Why can they not find a multitude of people from a variety of backgrounds and affiliations? The other convenient source on Xinjiang for the West is the Australian think tank ASPI. It's hardly independent given the funding it receives from the US, Australian and British governments, NATO and arms producers such as Lockheed Martin. But it's been caught by US government funded media as independent and nonpartisan. In a report led by the think tank so-called analyst Xu Xiaozhong, published in early 2020, more than 80,000 Uyghurs were allegedly forced to go out of Xinjiang and work in factories across China. But the report is also filled with flimsy arguments and self-contradictions. For instance, the document decries the isolation of Uyghur workers who speak almost no Mandarin while denouncing Mandarin language classes offered to these workers as political indoctrination. Nevertheless, the report received instant international attention with little critical engagement. Well, I also talked to two researchers who did their own study in response to AISPI's report. They interviewed 70 workers from Xinjiang, including Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities, at five different companies in Guangdong to find out more about their situations. They came to work in Guangdong out of their own choice and free will. Uh, like there are several reasons for them to came to Guangdong, such as the high salary and the natural environment, and some of them want to um, broaden their horizons, to ask them to stay in Xinjiang and do not leave Xinjiang. You have to stay there, like in, their, in your whole life, you have to work there. It is not fair. After being quoted extensively in Western media reports, Adrian Zenz and the ASPI have paved the way for Western policies to impose Xinjiang-related sanctions. So what do the people in Xinjiang themselves have to say about these allegations? I went there in April 2021 and spoke to people living there, including Uyghurs. Here's what they told me. Özgürüşü 寄他们的货衣服生意也特别好未来还想待在新疆吗那必须的我们是我们去的吗全是谣言全是谣言为什么他们要讲这些谣言这是第二嘛就是对中国的第一态度的嗯他们看不见他们那个中国的崛起
since China's reform in opening up policies, despite growing at an annualized pace almost 10 percent a year, the Chinese economy has reportedly stalled, stumbled and even collapsed multiple times. This Guardian report from 10 years ago, for instance, analyzed how China's collapse will bring economic crisis to climax. This Economist article expanded on the great fall of China as early as in 2015. The BBC wondered in 2019 how bad is China's economic slowdown. When the Chinese economy encountered headwinds eventually due to the COVID-19 pandemic, media started counting the number of shaky legs it was standing on. Three or one, depending on whom you ask. But if you read the articles, none of these legs seemed shaky at all. But the development of China has had a tremendous impact on the rest of the world. First of all, it's created a big new growing market which has benefited countries around the world. And great news for the U.S. economy at last, according to Bloomberg, as U.S. growth seen outpacing China's for the first time since 1976. But if you read further, this would only be the case if China's growth hits the worst case scenario for the year. It seems baffling to some, a bit ironic even, that the Western societies can be outperformed by a non-white population led by a communist party in a non-Western system and without waging wars. We see a problem and we ignore it. China sees a problem and they fix it. We're not losing to China. We lost. The returns just haven't all come in yet. Absolutely. It is. It's envy. It's jealousy it's their their deeply seated beliefs that they are superior all unraveling the progress that chinese society is making uh, it's something that you have to see to believe but when you see it you fully understand how this threatens a west how to make sure that china does not continue its current trajectory and surpass the west the ability to shape global discourse is of course a key and the third deadly sin, lust, is all about that power. One example is how media mogul Rupert Murdoch can control public discourse through the media empire that he owns. With hundreds of brands in traditional and new media in Australia, the UK, the United States, he can manipulate public opinion on any given topic. In May 2020, Sherry Markson, a host on Sky News Australia, which is owned by Murdoch, published an article on a tabloid owned by him, claiming China deliberately suppressed or destroyed evidence of the coronavirus outbreak, citing a Western government dossier. Immediately, she went on Fox News, owned by Murdoch, to talk about her investigation. She was also interviewed by right-wing Trump backers, including Steve Bannon, on the subject. Although her evidence was deemed insignificant by Western insiders, the media exposure has drawn wide international attention to her expose. This heralded a new wave of accusatory pieces against China. This pandemic came out of China, and it came out of China for a reason. Journalist and author Shari Markson investigates the potential leak of the virus from the top secret laboratory in China. Mystery surrounds the high security lab at the Wuhan Institute of Virology that handles the world's most dangerous pathogens. Sky News Australia referred to her so-called documentary, What Really Happened in Wuhan, as revealing quote-unquote explosive revelations about the origin of COVID-19 without showing any solid evidence or conclusion. Same thing goes for the Wall Street Journal another branch of Murdoch's empire, which produced its so-called news exclusives on Wuhan, using unsourced and unproven evidence. Sherry Markson also published a book called What Really Happened in Wuhan with the publishing house HarperCollins. Guess what? It's still Murdoch's. He was either your worst enemy or your best friend. Uh, he then moved on to Britain, did the same thing, and then to the United States and did it again. He was controlling who was in power in three Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, literally spanning the world. 
And the, these, and he honed it down. You have one source, quote that source, quote another source, and it's circular. There's no new information. It's just requoting it. Despite all the hype, there is not a single shred of evidence to support the claim that the virus was either produced or leaked from a lab in China. Although I have been collaborating with Cheng Li Shi from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, I don't think neither Cheng Li, neither us, we could engineer a virus such as uh, sars cov virus. As an epidemiologist who kind of looks at the totality of data, there is no directionality, and that lacks of directionality, in my sense, is the best evidence that there is no, you know, specific lab origin. The case of Murdoch is just one example of how capital manipulates public opinion and sentiments. The relationship between Western governments and the media is an open secret. You know, we often think that the United States has this free press, but actually the United States government and the press are very connected and oftentimes all they serve is to paint a picture of China that is inhumane and quote unquote uncivilized. They also promote the policies that uh, governments who are antagonistic towards China, like the United States, uh, they uh, are therefore justified. An apparent commonality in China-related reporting is tracing any responsibility all the way to the top Chinese leadership. Any potential problems or abuse would be attributed to systematic directives with sinister intentions given from the very top. And so they're going to attack that system that is creating harmony, cooperation and progress inside China. This is what they want to undo. That's what the, this war is actually against uh, China's progress and its rise. And in order to undermine that, they have to find the source of, of that rise's strength. And that is exactly what they're doing by targeting the, the government, it's the leadership of the Chinese people. All media need attention to make a point. But when it comes to China reporting, there seems to be no bottom line. Let's talk about deadly sin number two, greed. Greed for attention using whatever means. China is certainly no stranger to criticism, but the level of ingenuity in framing the subject keeps reaching new highs. The Belt and Road Initiative is a prime victim and suspect. It's designed as an economic initiative to share opportunities and benefits with partners around the world, but it's been degraded to the rank of new colonialism. This Guardian report asks, China in Africa, win-win development or new colonialism? When reading such a headline, what do you think is being implied? The diplomat asks, is China a new colonial power? Um, readers, decide for yourselves but China is already on the defense seat. African countries have their say in the matter, but that voice is hardly ever channeled on mainstream international media. Colonialism is colonialism, partnership is a partnership. Is this China that we know, that we trust, and has no comparison with any sort of colonialism or neo-colonialism? We came to China. China did not come to Sri Lanka with a bag full of dollars and say, here's the money spent. We came to China. We are finding it difficult to pay back loans, but most of these loans are not from China. Diplomacy is another strategic term exclusively reserved for China. From debt trap to masks, from vaccines to traditional Chinese medicine, when China provides assistance or public goods to other countries, this term is almost inevitably used to imply there are underlying geopolitical calculations. And the idea that uh, global South countries can cooperate with, um, with China um, you know, get infrastructure, uh, renewable energy, um, public transport. This is seen as a, as a threat to the United States. I mean, how can 
these development projects possibly be a threat to the United States, but this is how it's presented because they want to they want to have um, geopolitical control over these regions of the world. From greed, I'm finally shedding light on the number one deadly sin that's plaguing mainstream Western media and the core of the problem in my eyes, pride. The famous ancient thinker Saint Augustine once said, it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. The pride to be right seems to be turning Western media and political establishment into devils who see China's peaceful rise as a pacing thread. Chinese senior officials' recent visit to the South Pacific, for instance, is seen not just as a threat to Australia, but also to journalism in the region. China is said to be the reason why Japan is turning away from post-World War II pacifism and Russia's being an independent country is reportedly potentially subordinate itself to China, thus posing a threat to Japan. And the list of such headlines goes on and on. Such narratives are increasingly dominating China-related reports, especially after the U.S. Secretary of State labeled China the most serious long-term threat to the current international order. Now, China is seen as a quote-unquote threat, and I think that's where a lot of this negativity comes from. Pride goes once again to American exceptionalism. I mean, it's this idea that we're absolutely right, that we can't be wrong, um, you know, that everything that we do. But the, the, the reality is that as we speak, trust in the United States has gone down to an all-time low. They have no, no, no faith in their government. They have no faith that things are getting better. Pride is literally killing us. We cannot see beyond our own faults. The opposite of pride is humility, which allows people to be open-minded to new ideas and experiences. Despite the enormous socio-economic progress China has made, it has become politically incorrect in the West to acknowledge China can do something right. You can hear the, the phrase, at what cost? So China's um, eliminated poverty, but at what cost? China is providing free vegetables to citizens in lockdown to save their lives from COVID, but at what cost? And so you can really see a laziness in the way in which the, the, the media are just dutifully following basically a political line which is dictated from the White House. Such a mentality seems deeply entrenched in the minds of Western journalists and editors, including those in the visual department. Positive images of China are hard to combine on Western media these days. These photos showing Chinese sports champions have caused furor among Chinese viewers for obvious reasons. That may explain why those who set foot in the country would find a completely different country from what they were told before. They have honestly done a stellar job with the whole COVID protocol. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. Being stateside, you kind of heard some pretty bad media and that is completely false. It's actually been phenomenal. As much as Western journalists pride themselves as the fourth estate, but the reality is over one million people have died in the U.S. of COVID-19 and counting. Nobody has been held accountable. There may be conscientious voices asking the difficult questions, but they have apparently not made a real difference. Something to be proud of? In all fairness, China is by far not perfect but has gotten more than its fair share of criticism in overseas media for being different and trying to keep it that way. In the foreseeable future, as long as the US is obsessed with competing with China, we may see more manifestation of the seven deadly sins I have listed. Pride in being right and better, greed for attention, lust for control, envy of success, gluttony for toxic sources, self-defeating wrath, and sloth in critical engagement. Just bear in mind, the real picture might be very different. Next time, when you come across a report on China, will you know any better? <laughs>